Lord, thank you so much for this day. Um, thank you, Lord, for this prayer. Thank you that um, we get to hear your word. Uh, but more than anything, your word um, is not just to be heard, it's to be felt. It's to be um, chewed on and digested and lived out. So I pray for your power and your grace to do so. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read it together. Our Father. Ready? Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Well, it's nice. You guys are really talking back today. It's good. I can hear your voices. You give it to me about once a year. So I guess this is the day. So today, today's the day, I guess. Okay. So we, we talked about the Lord's Prayer. If you haven't been here, you guys, know, uh, you guys will find out soon that we've been in the Lord's Prayer series. We're examining the prayer that our Jesus gave to his disciples and thereby giving it to all of us. And we talked about how the Lord's Prayer itself is a corrective. Do you remember this? And how when we pray the Lord's Prayer, you're like, PB, that looks exactly like your glasses. Okay, how about now? When you pray the Lord's Prayer, you end up correcting your vision and your version of God. You find that your vision of God gets clearer and clearer. And then we talked about how the Lord's Prayer points to the fact that Jesus uses the words, our Father, to address God. And so we talked about how our Father it's, it's, it's so uh, uh, radical, such a radical departure from the way people prayed back then. And we were saying that Jesus was meaning to show us how close he is to us, just like when you have your prayer shawl over your head and you have it closed, that private space between your breath and this cloth, what, what we call your prayer room, we said Jesus is saying God is as close to you as you are with your breath. And today we're going to talk about his use of plural pronouns. What's up? Now, in this part, he doesn't go off in a radical departure from traditional prayer models. You see, our father, he does, because we know that the Jews pray the Shema, right? They said, our Lord, our God is one. They address God in that way. And then we know that the Gentiles address God as what? Master or O King. But when Jesus says to address your God, he says to address him as father. But then everything else is very traditional. And this is for a purpose. If I can, if there's a highlighted version of our, uh, this prayer, if you look at the plural pronouns, it's interesting. This prayer never, ever uses the singular. This is Jesus' one chance to make sure that his students all learn how to pray properly. And he makes sure, this is not an accident, he makes sure that there is never an I or me in this prayer. Hello? Prayer, someone once said, is very personal, but it's never private. It's always communal. It's always communal. So, Recently we said, okay, we know, we know what it does. We know what the Lord's Prayer does. It corrects our vision and our version of the Father God. But do we know how to use the prayer? 
Do we know how to use the prayer? You guys know I love this story. Some of you guys have heard me talk about Joseph Griffin. <laughs> this is such a dad move. If you look at Joseph Griffin, he, he bought a GoPro and was like, I'm going to film our family vacation to Las Vegas. And he goes and he films the entire vacation with his family, but he did not know how to use the GoPro. He turned it around and it was facing him the whole time. So when he went to go edit and look at the vacation, it's just countless hours of him wandering around with amazement. And nobody else is seeing his family member. Someday they're going to see this and go, Dad, it was just all about you. See, we know what that GoPro does. Come on, somebody. But do we know how to use it? And so by not using it properly, we forfeit the very power of that vehicle or tool. Hello? Now, I don't want you to think that this prayer is an exception, like, oh, Jesus just made sure that his number one prayer to the disciples were always in a plural pronoun. No, this is the general, the general disposition of God's people that we are always thinking about us rather than just me. Hello? Hmm. So, Scripture, I mean, uh, uh, the Lord's Prayer is a corrective, but it's also a collective. What do I mean by that? Well, Scripture has another word for collective. Uh, I think it's a better word, but it, it's a very, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, agricultural word. And the way Scripture wants us to imagine the collective is that God has grafted us into a tree. If we're like a, a different type of branch, he grafted us into himself and his people. He made us one with who he is and what he's about. And this is why we always say we, because we are always praying whenever we're praying the Lord's Prayer about this entire tree, not just us, the branch. Come on, somebody. We are constantly concerned about the whole revelation of God and the whole purpose of God. Not just my desire, my dreams, and my destiny. Oh, I love that I was called of God to pastor this generation. Oh, I love it. I'm not being sarcastic. I love it. But there is one part that I do not love. And the part that I do not love is the constant desire to ask me to what? Participate in that person, that Christian's Desperate search for self. When the gospel's primary pre premise is die to yourself. That's like if I was a physical trainer, which I will never be. <laughs> Imagine if I was a workout guy that you came to. And I kept saying, what kind of pie can I make you? That's what I like to talk to you about, apple pies and cherry pies. I may be called to get banana pies. Really? Let's make it happen. No. This church is designed to slap that pie out of your hand. <laughs> this is what happens when you use illustrations you didn't plan for. <laughs> um, now I'm like, where do I go with this pie thing? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're grafted in to God as if we are the branch in the tree. So what are you literally saying, people? Every time we use the words our and us, we are declaring that we are part of the God who is the creator, 
God of Abraham, God of the covenant, God of the exodus, God of salvation, God of the new creation. We are saying we are part of that God story. Our and us in the Lord's prayer wakes you up from the slumber of narcissism. That's what it's designed to do. You see, when I go to the Lord and I pray, our Father, immediately I'm teleported to the past. And it's God's redemption. If you look at the screen there, I'm connected to history. I'm connected to what God did in the past, right? What God did for his people in the past. Now what he did for Abraham, I'm a part of that. Come on, somebody. When God split the Red Sea, I inherit that story. Now it's my God. Now it's our father. When it was never our father, we were Gentiles. Hello? But when we got adopted in by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, now that's our story. But not only does it give us history, and a side note, history always gives you your identity. So now I'm not just rooted in God's history and God's redemptive past. I am also clinging on or tethered to the future. Every time I say our father and us, I am part of the resurrection story. Hello? Every time, this week when you pray, our father who is in heaven, our, 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 you are placing yourself in the context of history and then you are reminding yourself that you are part of a team or a missional team, a family, whatever you want to call it, a tribe or or a nation or, or citizens of heaven, you are part of something bigger that's going somewhere. So when you're feeding this your child this week, and you're nursing your child, or, or when you're printing out your Excel spreadsheets for work, when you're, when you're talking to your coworkers, when you're telling your employees what to do next and giving them a direction and vision, you must realize that you're all doing it as a person of redemption and resurrection. You're part of something bigger, guys. Sunday is not just... Oh, it's nice to see you, nice to see you, nice to see you. No, Sunday is what? The gathering of the saints that remind each other we have all been redeemed by God. That's why we're here. And we're all headed somewhere. That's why we're here. But there's one more thing that our and us, the plural pronouns, do for us as the Lord intended. It does not just root us into the past and it does, it does not just give us a sense of vocation for the future. It makes us aware of the present call. Every time we use the word our and us in a heartfelt prayer time with God, we realize that we are part of the current an ongoing responsibility of the church. Can I get an amen? I tell you what, guys. I tell you what. The greatest, the, the greatest weapon the enemy has against all of us, starting the minute we walk out of this room, is that you forget who you are, where you're headed, and what you're called to do. And so you meander around the week thinking about what will get you the next high or the next step in the ladder to move forward or the next piece of whatever to secure some sense of peace and security. You are just on the hunt for something more. 
But when you get released out of here, you know what you were supposed to be feeling all week as you pray, our Father? I know who I am. I know where this is all headed. And I know what I'm called to do. Everywhere I go, I am part of the Our Father group. PB, I know what to pray, but I'm going to ask you, do you know how to pray? I love what Stanley Auerhouse says, and he's talking about, in this article, he's talking about the church, but I'm using it in light of the Lord's Prayer because the church is essentially built on the Lord's Prayer. I just want you to hear this. The enti- if you unpack the Lord's Prayer, it gives you the mission of the entire church of Jesus. Somebody once said, why are pastors always asking God for a vision when the founder already gave one? We have a mission, and it's all laid out in the Lord's Prayer. Did you know that? And this is what Stanley Auerhaus says. I love this. He says, uh, uh, but I'm using it for the Lord's Prayer. It says, the Lord's Prayer is designed to defeat narcissism and call people to the church's eschatological mission to witness to Christ's cross and resurrection. Did you see that? When you pray our and us, it's designed to defeat that thing in you that wants to make every day about you. And instead, when you pray the Lord's Prayer, you realize, man, eschatological, we are headed towards the glory of God. If we took a snapshot of your week at any moment of your week, does your internal face and countenance look that way to the future? Or is it so preoccupied with the worries of the present? When we take a snapshot of your life and your heart, we should see people in this house, when they pray the Lord's Prayer, they're constantly looking down. I'm going there. I'm going there. And whatever I am a part of here, I'm going to do my best to make here look like what's going to happen there. Uh, Here's another way of saying this. When you have this mission and vocation burning in you, it's no longer about you at your job. The question is not, how do I advance in my career? The question is, what would it look like if that Lord who's coming, come on somebody, was the manager or the boss here? Kevin, you are a teacher. Are you still a teacher? Okay, you're a teacher. When you hit Monday, right, tomorrow, you face your kids, and you just want to hug them, right? (laughs) You want to hug your kids. The question to you for you, Kevin, is not how do I make it through today without yelling at these kids? The question to you is internally, you're like, I'm a, I'm a part of the people that is looking forward to that. And so you say, what would it look like if that God was teaching this class? That's the Lord's Prayer being used correctly. Hello. Stanley Auerhouse continues. He says, the good work, the good work is what the Lord's prayer is pointing to. The good work frees us from self-centeredness created by the hurts we cherish. Vocation is more to be desired than victimhood. You know what Auerhouse is saying? Every time you guys pray the Lord's prayer, and you use our, we, us, you're reminded of the corporate mission. You're reminded that you're people with a mission, a vocation, and that is to be more desired than what? Having a place where your wounds can be cherished. Often when people say, I feel loved by this or that church, What they're saying is, I feel that this or that church is recognizing and tending to the wounds that I cherish. Can I say something to you? 
your wounds are not the highlight of this gathering. We all have wounds. Some of you guys are like, not my kind of wounds. Mine are, some of you guys play that whole, my wounds are bigger than your, okay, fine, you won. You, you won. So what do you want? What do you want? When I talk to people, seriously, from this church or other churches, they base the success of that church based on how many groups or meetings that they can go to where their wounds are acknowledged and cherished. But our house says vocation is to be desired more than victim. What does that mean? When you pray the Lord's Prayer with our and we, you wake up from that life where it so cherishes that victimhood in your life. And it tells you, rise up. You're called to something bigger. You're called to something bigger than just nursing your wounds all the time. PB, I don't feel very therapized here because this is not a therapy center. Get a therapist. Get a therapist to deal with your wounds. But my Bible says that by his wounds, I am healed. I am healed of what? Healed of all pain and suffering in life? No, I am healed. I hope you catch this. I am healed from the difficulties and pains in life that would have bound me and made me stuck living here forever. I am free from the tyranny of that pain. Man, I w- PB, I feel like... Stop feeling. Now, I say this because we have a church that acknowledges pain. We have a church that admonishes you to seek help. You have a pastor who has a therapist. So I don't want you to ever think PB is saying, don't get help, don't get healed, don't get better. But get better so you can be a part of our and we and us vocation. You're like the athlete that got hurt that was supposed to be the star player. And the whole year you miss out on on the season and you're just nursing your wounds. And then everyone's supposed to acknowledge that. You're not to be acknowledged for that. You're to be acknowledged for playing the game. Like that, like, oh, great goal. (laughs) Do people people say goal? Great accomplishment with that ball. (laughs) That's what it's supposed to be. Do you know that some of you are only known for the wounds you share? But when you say, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom, not my kingdom, your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven, unhindered, unadulterated. Come on, somebody, right? And then give us today, us, all of us. It's not okay that I just get the bread. All of us got to get it because all of us got something to do for you. That's like a military captain going, as long as I have my rations, my platoon, you got to deal with yourself. No, you are in the war together. You have a mission. We lost 120 some adults during COVID. Hello? 120 of us disappeared. Now, Granted, some of them had to go. Some of them didn't want to be here. Some of them, they're here, they're just not here yet. Does that make sense? They're in their pajamas, okay? But what I'm here, but, but some of them should not have gone. Some of them got snipered out. And it should bother you. 
because they're part of our and us. People always say, PB, you have the hardest job. I know. PB, <laughs> PB, oh, you must have such a hard time because so many people are struggling. And the American church suffers so much during COVID. And you know what I want to say because I never say it in front of your face? Because why? I fear rejection, right? <laughs> because I want you to love me. But here's what I really want to say. And I say it out here so that none of you can go, that was for me? No, I say it up here. It's like a volleyball. Here. You know what I say? You know what I say? Why is it that I am having the hard time? PB, you should do something. You should do something. People are like totally like just checking out and just leaving church. Whoa. Why? Why me? I thought it was our father and our God's kingdom. Come on, somebody. The success of this church is on you. And I'm not talking about numbers. I'm talking about vocation. See, some of you guys sat here. I know this sounds condemning. It's not. It's just shaming. Okay? <laughs> James, James 650 over there came up. Right? It looked like he was about to promote a club. Right? <laughs> it did a little bit, didn't it? It did. It did. Hi, I'm 650. I got a club in Los Angeles. <laughs> no, but this man of God, I call him a man of God because I've seen him live, okay, his whole life. I've seen him change all these years. He comes up here, and you got to understand, if James is up here asking you to forfeit just a couple hours on a Saturday so you can be part of the vocation of God, to pay attention to those that God is paying attention to, and you sat here and said, somebody else would do it. This tells me you ain't praying the Lord's Prayer. When God called me and Michelle back there, PM back there, who looks half my age today. Why are you dressed like that today? <laughs> oh, because you're serving buddies today. That's right. I was like, dude, I look so old compared to you right now. Um, when we started Echo, the call of God and the responsibility of God was that we start it. But it's your job to finish it. I can quit tomorrow and say, I did what God asked me to do. Can you? Can you with this church? One of my favorite conversations I had recently was with a member in our church and he looks at me and he gives me a big hug and he says, PB, uh, the, the weight of the church is no longer on you. And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, listen, you taught us enough. We know what to do. From here on, it's our responsibility. So I'm going to read the Lord's Prayer like this, with a singular pronoun, and I want you to see how awkward it is. My Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give me this day my daily bread, and forgive me of my debts, as I also forgive my debtors. And leave me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And when I prayed this prayer, many of us felt like that is a fantastic prayer. You know why? Because we have been trained by our world and our culture that this is the norm. All right. So what happens when we pray like this, PB, what is the big deal, right? Honestly, is it that bad if we just sway a little bit from the desire for our and us like the Lord had intended and we just kind of veer off to my, me, myself? Is it that bad? No, not always. Sometimes we do pray, right, about our needs and stuff. Of course he wants to hear you. 
okay? But I'm talking about a general disposition. When you think that your life is your own, when you think that your calling is your own, when you're searching for your only de- your own destiny alone, and you're not synced into and saturated in the call of the body of Christ, you will sway away. And these are the two effects of a Lord's Prayer when we do not pray the Lord's Prayer seriously with our heart, the plural pronouns. The two things that happen is that equality is diminished and evangelism dwindles. Equality diminishes and evangelism dwindles. What do you mean, PB? I'm going to tell you what I mean. Our Lord's church throughout history has prayed this prayer. This is the most recited prayer in Western history. But then, in about 1570, we know the Catholic church started dominating this Western religious world. Now, I'm not blaming it on the Catholics, because you got to remember that most of us were Catholic back then. Okay? And so I want you to know something. There's a Jesuit. There's a Jesuit named Alessandro uh, Villignano. And he was the vicar general for the church in Japan in 1579. And this guy systematically charted out what he believed how we should see the world. Now, what I'm about to show you is going to shock you because what he came up with is not really new. This was already uh, uh, embraced during this time in the West. And here's what I'm about to say. That people of lighter skin were more valued than people of darker skin. Now, all of us know that in history, right? We know that. We know about all these things that happen, all the crusades and, and, and colonialism, all this stuff, and even the church's exercise of, uh, of power, right, over the nations. We know the corruption. But what we don't know or we didn't know is how much the church veered off from the hour and us. We veered off so much that equality diminished almost completely. The world benefits, the world benefits when God's people pray our, we, and us because it begins to give us an eye for the other the way God sees the other. So the Jesuit came up with this chart. Did you see this chart? This is an actual chart of the potentiality of salvation and formation in Christ that this guy came up with, that the West not only adhered to, but absolutely embraced. They embraced it so much because of their need, what, for slavery. And I want you to see, this is a Christian chart, guys. These are the people that are supposed to be praying our Father. Here we go. The white people, the Euro white on the left, if you look at that bar, the brown bar, that's the, as you go down, you are darker skinned. As you go up, you are lighter skinned. If you notice, this man basically says, if you are European and white, right, you not only have a greater chance of being saved, now get this, here's the kicker, you're worth discipling because you're more likely to be like Jesus. Then Japanese, some of you guys are like, Japanese? How did it go from Europe to Japanese? Because homeboy was in Japan. (laughs) That's why. That's all he sees. And he notices Japanese skin are what? Fair and light. And he said, these people still have civilized. So then he says, they're next in line to have the potentiality of being saved and invested in to become full-fledged citizen of heaven. Then it all goes down. The castizos are mixed races and mestizos are mixed races, right? And then after that is the Indians and then the blacks. P, 
Maybe, are, do we really take the Lord's prayer seriously? This is what happens when we don't take it seriously. When we do not live into the Lord's prayer, we begin to measure and put value in this world that God never intended. The Lord's Prayer is designed to get rid of sexism. The Lord's Prayer, by design, is, to get, is designed to get rid of racism, classism, ableism, and ageism. I've been guilty of this too. I see a church, when I see a church uh, full of old people, I can't believe I even said this. I'm so embarrassed right now. But I'm going to tell them myself. Is that okay? You laughed really hard about that. Um, I'm going to tell you, I, I met this pastor uh, last year during COVID, and we're talking about, <laughs> this is so bad, we're talking about his building, and his building is, is just it's a beautiful building in downtown Fullerton, and it's, and it's just filled with old people. And these old people are basically dying. They're dying off. And so as an, as an act of faith, I thought, but really it could expose my age, ageism. I said to the pastor, just give me the building. And the guy was like, Looking at me like, nobody has ever asked me straight up, right? And I was like, yeah, give it to us. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, we have a church full of young people. We can use this. And we'll support your ministry. What was I saying to this guy? What was I saying? Your ministry to these old people, not as important as the vibrant young people we have. By the way, you're no longer young. But <laughs> when, when we had younger people. But if I, was a, if I was a our father person at that moment, what would I have I said? Pastor, it don't matter if they're dying off. It don't matter if you're down to 20, 30. I will be praying for your church. Because God thinks it's important because you're part of the Our Father story. After confessing that now, I feel like I have to call that pastor. Oh, shoot. Oh, shoot. It's weird, huh? Like a pastor convicting himself on stage. So this is never, you, people shouldn't preach like this. Galatians 3 says, you are all God's children through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you who are baptized in Christ Jesus, uh, Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, uh, nor slave nor free, nor is there male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male. Uh, I just read this, you're all one in Christ Jesus. You... There is no differentiator anymore. There is no isms in Christ. We should be able to have some very wealthy people in here and some very not so wealthy people in here. And there should be complete peace about it. We should be able to have different races in here and there should be complete peace about it. Hello? We should be able to have women leading and have absolutely no issues about it. Because outside of here, everybody has an issue about it. Hello? All right, I'll leave you alone. So let's land this plane, yeah? Let's land this plane. So, it, the Lord's Prayer helps us to remember that this is a collective, it's, it's a, a, a communion with God and his history in the future and our current responsibility. The Lord's Prayer also gives us the courage 
to undo and leave the system of injustices in our world, right? Okay, but what is something else that it does? What is something else that it does? It does one more thing when we pray with the plural. Are you ready? Say yeah. 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 You ready? You ready? It comforts us. It comforts us. And here's how it comforts us. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance. There's that vocation again, the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. What are you saying, PB? When we pray our, we, us, and we are aware of God's past and God's coming future and all the vocation and the call of the present, we are also comforted by the fact that when we say our, we're not just saying our here. When we say our, we're saying our as in every God-fearing Christian in Fullerton, every God-fearing Christian in Orange County, come on somebody, every God-fearing, God-vocation, pumping Christian in Los Angeles County, in California, this nation, this world. Every time we say our, we are tethered to the body of Christ everywhere. When my daughter, I took my daughter once to a Christian concert. There's a thing called a Christian concert. So bothersome already, right? But there's a worship concert and where I took her. And she she went and she said this to me. She goes, Dad, I didn't know there were so many of us. She grew up with just this right here. She grew up with just that over there. And when I took her, when she went to this Christian concert and there was all these Christians worshiping God, she was like, I was so moved because there's more of us than we thought. There's this Anglican Anglican pastor that I know. He says, Brian, you know, you know what I used to say to my church all the time, and this is part of it is because it's in the liturgy, okay? But when you pray the Apostles uh, Apostles Creed, it talks about that the church is constantly aware of the communion of the saints, both living and dead. And then he says, did you know that when I looked at my small congregation of 30-some people, I used to say to them, rise up from your seats and worship God, for the cloud of witnesses is singing with us today. For there is no little church here, he used to say to them. It's not just 30 of us. There are millions of us singing right now together. Listen to the sound of the body of the saints in communion. Come on, somebody. You are not aware of the heavenly crowd of witnesses. You live like this is just your life. You live like your race is not being seen and cheered on by the cloud of witnesses. You live so much in the dark by yourself. Rise up, church. God's people, both past past and present and future, are all standing up and cheering for you. Cheering for you, why? So that you can live the American dream. There you go, get that BMW. There you go, buy that another, buy that other house. No! They're saying, yes, rise up, die to yourself again today, like we did, like we did. And then they literally did. I bet you they're so confused, they're not even being killed for their faith. Why why are they so weak? It's because we're not aware. We're not aware of the cloud. All right, let's end here. So when we pray the Lord's Prayer, guys, this is what's happening. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, everyone take out your phone, okay? Let's turn off all the lights. This is what's happening. 
in, 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 uh, in, second, in second Kings, there's a story. There's a story where this king, King Aram, who is in war with Israel. Do you know this story? And the prophet living at that time is dude, this dude named Elijah. And Elijah, he, this guy's a man of God. He keeps hearing the secrets of King Aram. So anytime Aram's like, Aram's like, hey, let's do this and let's go and surprise attack Israel, Elijah would hear it from God and tell the Israel king, spoiling the plans of this dude, right? So he gets mad and he goes, King Aram goes, listen, there's this prophet that keeps spoiling my plans. So let's get an army together. Let's go to Dotham and go confront this Elijah the prophet and kill this dude so we can go about having war with Israel. So then he takes his army, he takes them to Dotham where Elijah is, and then what happens? Elijah's servant goes out to meet, right? He goes out to see the, the commotion. Well, who's here? What's happening? And he notices this great army coming towards them to kill Elijah. Then the servant goes back, ah, right? Elijah, there is a group of soldiers coming our way. We're going to get killed, man. And what's the famous story? Elijah looks at him and says, what? Prays to the Father God and says, oh, our Father. This is my interpretation, okay? But he prays. And he basically says, open the eyes of my servant. And the servant goes out from the tent, looks up at the hills, and he goes, Elijah goes, look up at the hills and the mountains. What do you see? And when God opened the servant's eyes, he saw all these chariots of fire. He saw God's army, and he says what? This, I love this line. He says, there is more of us than there are of them. There is more of us than there are of them. You and I live like there is nobody up that hill. You and I live like there is no cloud of witnesses, both past, present, and future. You and I live as if only an army is coming our way. But when you pray, our Father, our, us, our, us, you are being tethered to the great narrative of God, the bigger story, the bigger race, the bigger destiny, the kingdom of God. If you're up here with me, this group right here, I want you to turn on your flashlights on your phone like this. Try it. Okay? Okay. Just to turn it on, all of you, if you have a phone, and just flash it at me. Just wave it at me like this. Not you. <laughs> not you, not yet. Sorry, Kevin. Just flash it at me. You know what Sunday feels like to many of us? It feels like right here, right? It's just us. Oh, let's worship the Lord. Let's make it. Let's make it as a church. It's not about echo, guys. We're part of Jesus' church. Can I get an amen? Now, everyone else, turn on yours. Flash it towards the group in the middle. Okay? Now, those in the middle, just flash it towards the middle. Now, those in the middle, I want you to look around. This right here is what's happening this right here is the reality. This little group up here, imagine it's us getting together for home group, for feeding people, for going to our good neighbor's house who, who just came from Afghanistan, loving on them. This is every little group in Echo meeting for any, anything of God. And we think it's just us. But if you look around, there's a cloud of witnesses. Right? Now, I want you to imagine this, everyone here, okay? If we busted this ceiling open, and it's in the middle of the night, 
and we're out in the wild and you look out and you see the gazillion stars shining bright down on us, I want you to imagine how little this group looks. And then I want you to imagine them flashing their lights and going, holy cow, there is a great cloud of witnesses that I am in communion with. It's called the communion of saints. Next time you're discouraged, next time you feel like you're alone, next time you want to check out, next time you want to quit this race, I want you to remember this moment. There is a cloud. There is a cloud. There is a cloud behind us cheering us on, saying you can die to yourself. You can rise to God's purposes in your life, and you can finish well. Amen? Let's pray. You can do this, guys. You can make it about our and us. You can snap out of that slumber of me, myself, and I. Hmm. Go ahead. Right now, just before we take communion, say, Lord, you are our Father. Just begin to use the plural. Help me to think about us. Help me to think about us, the body, the body. Bless me with this body. Bother me with this body. Burden me with this body. Help me commune with this body, the body of Christ. And as we take communion today, that is what you're communing in. As you commune with the Lord Jesus Christ, you are declaring that you're in communion with the body of Christ. Let's take the body. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given up for you. Take and eat. The blood of our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, given up for us. Take and drink. Let me bless you now. Father, I thank you. I thank you that we are the church. We're not just individuals. We're not just here for our blessing or to guarantee blessing over our own family units. We have been rescued, God, from that small, myopic story that the world offers. We are now in the bigger story. I pray as we pray, our Father, us, we this week, you will help us to snap out of it. Snap out of it so much that we would want to encourage those in the body. We will want to feed and host those in the body. Snap out of it so much that we will be bothered by injustice and inequality around us. We will snap out of it so much that people will say, you are very foreign here. Give us that strength. And this week, Lord, my prayer is that all of us will be conscious of the crowd, of that cloud of witnesses. Man, give us that vision that you gave that servant. Help us to see that hill full of chariots of fire. 
I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May Christ be victorious in your lives. Amen.